1931, a German army clerk, Hans Thilo Schmidt, saw an easy way to make money and sold stolen documents to the French Secret Service. The French met with their own cryptographers. They showed them the documents but got little response. War then seemed a long way off. Next, the Enigma material went to the British. At that stage, the British cryptographers were not convinced by mechanical code making and Germany didn't seem much of a threat. The offer was politely declined. Finally, the stolen documents went to the Poles. With Germany breathing down their necks, the response from them was very different. As soon as the Poles saw what was on offer, a deal was struck. With the stolen documents, three brilliant young Polish mathematicians, Zygalski, Rudziecki and Rajewski, set to work on the Enigma. The Poles soon realized that they had to find out how the Germans had wired the Enigma's keyboard to the first rotor. The number of possible wiring orders was astronomical, as any typewriter key could be wired to any letter on the rotor. But if the Poles could work this out, they would be a long way towards breaking the Enigma. Rajewski had a flash of inspiration, and he thought, what about if they'd been stupid enough to just use a, B, C, D was the order round the rotor. And they had. All the multitude of millions and millions of ways in which they could have scrambled the connection from the keyboard to the entry point, and they'd just chosen A, B, C, D. And Marie Andreessi, in desperation, tried that. It worked and suddenly he'd got the internal connections of the whole of the German forces machine. But then, on the eve of the invasion of Poland, the Germans introduced even more complications to the Enigma, and the Poles could no longer read any of the messages. They needed help. Out of desperation, they invited the British to a secret meeting deep inside a forest near Warsaw. They revealed how they had managed to break the enigma. The British were astonished. And Diddy Knox, he was one of the members of the team that went there. And the first thing he asked Rajewski was, what is this mapping from the keyboard to the entry rotor? And Rajewski said, A, B, C, D. And Diddy Knox went, oh! God, we never thought of that. It's too obvious. Why didn't we think of that? Within weeks of that meeting, Poland was invaded and war broke out. But the changes that the Germans had made to the Enigma meant that even with the Polish information, Station X was still in the dark. But as the flow of German messages increased, at last, the code breakers were beginning to see a way to achieve the impossible. The starting point was the messages themselves. The worldwide network of intercept stations was one of the last great achievements of the old British Empire, stretching from Scarborough to Singapore. They were known as Y stations. Wherever the Germans were, we were listening. When there was a lot of excitement, the wires would be absolutely humming with Morse. They'd be transmitting all over the place. We'd really have cramp in our fingers sometimes, trying to write it down non-stop. Round the clock, round the world, thousands of operators were writing down meaningless but vital groups of letters the raw material for Station X. The transmitter itself has a sound. Some of them were deep, some of them were light and tinny. And the sender, the man who's actually transmitting the Morse, 
he has his own particular way of sending letters. It's like a fingerprint. And so if they change frequency, we'd go looking for them. It's a little bit like a cat sitting outside a mouse hole, waiting patiently for something to happen, and the mouse to appear. As soon as we heard the sound of the man, the way he sent the letters, who was our man? Sometimes we'd get plain language, and that was mainly when they were being captured or the enemy, us, was actually on their doorstep. You'd get people sending messages to their control to please tell my mother where I am or my wife, which was very sad. We had one man who was trying to get a message to his mother, transmitting it to Germany to his control or his headquarters. And they were saying code, in code, in code. And of course, here's this poor man with the 8th Army tanks pointed at him outside. And they were telling him to code his message, you know. And this little man wants the message out before the 8th Army come through the door. All the Y station intercepts were carefully logged at Station X by call sign, frequency, date and time. One of the young recruits was given the task of analysing this flood of undecoded intercepts. For days and nights, Harry Hensley searched for clues. Harry Hensley was a son of a miner and the family didn't approve of his education and they thought he ought to get a job in the mines and uh, support the family. And Harry went off to Cambridge. And so poor Harry was very poor indeed, and when he came into the naval section, we all petted him. And I remember contributing to his 21st birthday present, which was a second pair of grey flannel trousers. Hinsley began to see patterns in the intercepts. There was always an increase in the flow of messages before major operations. If he could identify these increases, he could predict what part of the German war machine was about to mount an attack. Each day, Hinsley would report his findings to the Admiralty, and each day they would ignore him. In 1940, the top brass had little time for intelligence, or 21-year-olds. Traditionally, armies and navies around the world have not had great respect for intelligence officers. Field Marshal Haig is reported to have said, you know, that uh, an intelligence officer is something that you sort of do in your spare time uh, if you can't groom horses and, and, and do a variety of other things with the cavalry. It, I'm not quoting the Field Marshal verbatim, but uh, he had a low opinion of intelligence. It took a major catastrophe to change their minds. In June 1940, Hinsley warned the Admiralty that there were dramatic signs of impending German naval activity off the coast of occupied Norway. As usual, the old guard at naval headquarters took no notice. On the 8th of June, the British aircraft carrier HMS Glorious